Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, it's great to be back. Another Ramadan, a, another chance, another beginning of the 10 nights. May Allah bless these nights for all of us. May Allah accept our good deeds therein. And this is the third Ramadan without our dear, beloved Maulna Yusuf Islahi, rahimahullah ta'ala. May Allah put all of this in his scales, everything that is done here on this mimbar and this maqam and this masjid in his scales. As he reminded us in his last time he was here, if, if there comes a chance and he hear I'm no longer here, please pray for my maqfira. So let's remember him in our du'as. We owe so much to him. May Allah raise his ranks in paradise. May Allah forgive his sins. And may Allah continue to put all of this good work that he did and everything that comes out of it on his scales. Allahumma ameen. So this year, inshallah, we are going to do, in his tradition, continuing tafsir. Every year we have a slightly different twist. This year we decided to take uh, a topical approach to tafsir. Every night we'll cover one topic, a brief topic from the Qur'an, some teaching in the Qur'an, or some thematic commentary of the Qur'an on some topic. Tonight we want to talk about charity or giving, but not in the normal way that you're accustomed to. There are many types of charity, many types of giving. And there is a particular type of charity and giving that is so different, it's so difficult and it's so rare, but it is the highest form. And that is in the Quran, Allah praises the Muhajireen and He says, وَالَّذِينَ تَبَوَّأُوا الدَّارَ وَالْإِيمَانَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ يُحِبُّونَ مَنْ هَاجَرَ إِلَيْهِمْ وَلَا يَجِدُونَ فِي صُدُورِهِمْ حَاجَةً مِمَّا أُوتُوا وَيُؤْثِرُونَ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ وَلَوْ كَانَ بِهِمْ خَصَاصَةً وَمَنْ يُقَ شُحَّ نَفْسِهِ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ In this verse Allah is praising the Muhajireen, the, uh, the Ansar rather. Why? Because the Ansar were there first in Medina and the Muhajireen came to them as immigrants. And the Ansar had a precedence over them being that they were already there and many of them embraced Islam before the Muhajireen came. And they were ready to give everything. The type of um, generosity they displayed was unprecedented. It was so amazing that Allah described that generosity in this verse. So to give you background, there are different types of giving. There are different psychologies of giving, right? Um, I was reading something and it wasn't from a Muslim source, but they said there are three types of givers. And these three types of giver givers are grudge givers, there are duty givers and there are thanks givers. The grudge giver is a person who finds it hard to give. So he gives and he feels resentment in himself. So he hates to give, but when he gives he just feels he has his resentment in him. He's a grudge giver or she's a grudge giver. Um, there are many people like that. Allah in the Quran talks about people who hate to give. Um, there's a verse in Surah Muhammad. Allah says, Ha antum ha ula'i. These people are called to spend in the way of Allah. But he, and Allah says, when they're called to give, some of them, some of you are stingy. And Allah reminds them, if you are stingy, you're only hurting yourself. Allah is all sufficient. He doesn't need anything from you. You're the one who's needy. But when you're stingy, you're hurting your own self. So there are some people who hate to give and they give grudgingly, the grudge givers. There's another category of givers, they're the duty givers. They don't necessarily like to give either, but they recognize it's their duty. So they give because they're forced to give. It's kind of like a forced thing. So they're duty givers. And then the third type of person are the thanks givers, which are people who give freely. They give freely, they love to give, it's part of their nature, and they don't mind giving. They have no grudges, they have no remorse, they have no feeling of obligation, they do it of their own accord. 
This is the type of giving that's praised in the Quran. And this is the type of giving where you give in all circumstances that Allah loves and Allah praises. But even in this type of voluntary giving, there are so many types, there are so many levels. So in Arabic, someone who loves to give is called Sakhi. He's generous. Sakhi means generous. He just has by nature, he loves to give. There are people like that that you know in society. It's a beautiful thing, it's a great thing. People just, their nature is that they love to help people, they love to give. But then there's a higher level where people, they're always giving. They give frequently. So they give to others and they keep for themselves. So they take care of themselves and they take care of others. You always find them giving. So this person is higher than Sakhi. This person is called in Arabic Jawad. Someone who's Jawad is someone who has a quality of Jew, generosity, but to a higher degree. They're always frequently giving. But this verse is not speaking about the Sakhi, it's not speaking about the Jawad, it's not speaking about the one who freely gives. It's speaking about a level that's much higher. It's a level that is amazing, a level that is probably one of the highest forms of character you can find in human beings. And it's also very difficult. So this is where Allah says, وَالَّذِينَ تَبَوَّعُ الدَّارَ وَالْإِيمَانَ يُحِبُّونَ مَنْ هَاجَرَ إِلَيْهِمْ those who preceded them in homes and in faith, yani the, muha, the Ansar, they love those who migrate to them. They love the Muhajireen who came into their land. So this is an amazing quality. And then what does Allah say after that? وَلَا يَجِدُونَ فِي صُدُورِهِمْ حَاجَةً مِمَّا أُوتُوا And they have no remorse and no ill will in their hearts for what they give to these people who came to their land. In every society in the world, there's a tension between the indigenous and the immigrants. Especially in Muslim countries. Especially in the countries we come from. Lands that were created in the name of Islam. Like Pakistan today. Like India. Like all these countries. In Egypt. There's all this animosity towards those who have immigrated there. People feel, well, this is our land. People, look what they're doing with the Pathans in, in Pakistan. Look what they're doing with the Syrians in Turkey. When I was in Turkey a few years ago, the resentment had started to build up and people were breaking the shops of the Syrians who had fled the war and settled in Istanbul. And many of those people opened their hearts, but there were people that had ill will and there was this backlash. So you find this type of backlash all over the world between indigenous and immigrants. And immigrants are always looked down upon, especially in this country. It's one of the central issues in this election, isn't it? That people who come here and close the borders, build the wall and things like that. And it's a shame and it's a very tragic to see some Imams, you know, espousing that anti-immigrant talk and that rhetoric. There are prominent Imams that also talk about that and they're involved in that. But this is a different paradigm in the Quran. You know, yuhibbuna man hajara ilayhim. They love those who migrate to their land. Wala yajiduna fi sudurihim hajatan mimma utu. And they have nothing in their hearts against those who came and settled in their land. But then the quality, the real quality that they're praised for is this. Allah says, وَيُؤْثِرُونَ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ وَلَوْ كَانَ بِهِمْ خَصَاصًا They actually, not only do they have no resentment, not only do they love those who came to them, but they prefer them over themselves. And not only imagine that, they prefer those people over their own selves. It's not like, you know, they're equal to us, they're part of their fellow citizens. No. They prefer them. Ithar is a quality here. Over themselves. And here's the kicker. وَلَوْ كَانَ بِهِمْ خَصَاصًا Even though they themselves were in need. That's the real quality here. It's not that they're well off and they want to share their wealth. It's that they love those who came to them, they prefer them over themselves, and they share their wealth, although they themselves are needy. And that quality is so amazing. You cannot find that anywhere in the annals of human history. It's very hard to find that in human society where you're struggling, but yet you still give others. This quality is called ithar. Ithar is something praiseworthy in the Quran. Allah loves those who have ithar. And Allah praised the Ansar who had this tremendous quality. Probably one of the highest forms of human conduct you can find. One of the highest forms of altruism. Helping others, even though you yourself are in need. Everyone understands when you're wealthy, you help others. Okay, you have an obligation. What about when you yourself is need, are needy? So how does this actualize? You know, if you look in the, the books of our histories, incredible with the Muhajireen and the Ansar, the dynamic that was there. 
First of all, the messenger, he made this brotherhood between them. Right? He, he, he divided up, you know, he assigned a brother to each, one from the immigrants, one from the, the Ansar. And then, if you look at what they did, each one of them, the, the ones who were there already, the, the Ansar, they were ready to divide up everything. They would offer their homes to these people and say, you know what, half of my home is yours. And even some of them offered their wives and they said, you know what, we're ready to divorce some of our wives and you can have them. Obviously, they didn't take that offer, but this is the generosity that they had. Everything that they had, they were ready to give to these people. And this is something Allah praised. One of the best, you know, if you look at the background and when this hadith, this, this, this verse was revealed, there's a hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari that shows you this dynamic. Shows you what this quality and actuality was. So hadith in Sahih Bukhari where Abu Huraira relates that Anna Rajulan Atan Nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Fabaratha ila nisa'ihi. A man came from far away to the Messenger of Allah and he was needy and he was a traveler. He wanted to be, you know, fed. So the Prophet sallallahu he sent word to his home, to his wife, one by one, and he said, We have a guest, we need to feed him, what should we do? And what did they say? They said to, to him, Ma ma'ana illa ma. Nothing in our house except water. So he sent word to his other wife. He said the same thing. Then his other wife, same thing. And then he came to the masjid, or he was already in the masjid, and he said to the people, Man yudifu hadha. Who is going to be the host for this guest of mine? Can you imagine? There's a guest of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he said, who is going to be the host? And a man from the Ansari, many people raised their hand. A man from the Ansari, he raised his hand. He said, I will, Ya Rasulullah. When these people raised their hand, just imagine, they didn't know what they had at home. They just wanted to be the host. So that generosity was, was, is, is, was incredible and praiseworthy. So this man, he raised his hand. He said, I will. And the Prophet said, okay, he is your guest. So this man came home. And he said to his wife, Akrimi Daifa Rasulillahi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We have a guest of the Messenger of Allah, make sure you prepare something good for him. And she said to him, What did she say to him? She said, Ma ma'ana illa ta'am li sibyanina. We have only food, enough food for our children. We don't have enough food in the house, only enough for our children. So he said to her, He said, Look, okay, let's find a solution. He didn't say, Okay, let me go back and turn him away. He said to her, ta'amiki wa aslihi sirajaki wa nawimi sibyanaki. He said, okay, you know what, go ahead and prepare the food and put a lamp on, I have a plan, and put the kids to sleep so they won't ask for the food. And she said, exa she did exactly that. She prepared the food, that was enough only for the children, she put the kids to sleep, she prepared a lamp. And then he said, you know, when the, when the guests come, just pretend you're fixing the lamp and put the light out so then pretend that the light went out and then we can eat. We'll sit with them or pretend we're eating with them. And that way they won't know that there's not enough food. So they did exactly that. The guest, he ate to his fill. And then he went back to the masjid and went to sleep in the masjid. فَلَمَّا أَصْبَحَ غَدَى إِلَىٰ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم. The next morning when the man went to the masjid, to the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم, he already knew what happened. He said, لَقَدْ دَحِكَ اللَّهُ أَوْ عَجِبَ مِنْ فِعَالِكُمَا He said, Allah was so pleased with your action yesterday. وَأَنزَلَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى وَيُؤْثِرُونَ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ وَلَوْ كَانَ بِهِمْ خَصَاصًا So Allah revealed this verse that they prefer others over themselves even though they themselves are in need. So this is an incredible, incredible demonstration of ithar and action. You know, it's all about that iman, that level of iman in your heart and the taqwa and the generosity that you have. Allah finds a way for you. So this is incredible. It's not just spending from the excess wealth like zakat. But this is spending from the wealth that you yourself need. And you can find that in, you know, in, in the society of Medina. There's so many examples of itha. So many examples. This can only come when people are willing to spend from what they love. That's why Allah says, you know, لا يؤمن أحدك or the Messenger said, لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى يحب لأخيه ما يحب لنفسه. None of you will ever have complete iman until you love for your brother or sister what you love for yourself. So charity is not you're giving away something you don't need or something that's extra, something you don't like, but it's giving away what you like. 
is giving away what is pleasing to you, what you yourself want. Allah says in the Quran, لَن تَنَالُوا الْبِرَّ حَتَّى تُنْفِقُوا مِمَّا تُحِبُّونَ You will never attain complete piety, birr, until you spend from what you love. Until you spend from the best of your wealth, what you love the most, that's what you give away. Like Talha bin Ubaidillah who gave away his favorite garden. When he heard this verse, he had one garden he loved. And you'd give other wealth away. But when he heard this verse, he went to the best what he had, what he didn't want to give, and he gave it. So this is what spending from what you love. Spending and loving for others for what you love for yourself. And beyond that, loving others more than you love for yourself. So it's really incredible. The charity is not, as Allah says in the Quran, Allah says, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَنْفِقُوا مِن طَيِّبَاتِ مَا كَسَبَتُمْ وَمِمَّا أَخْرَجُنَا لَكُمْ مِنَ الْأَرْضِ or you who believe, spend from what you have earned with your hands and for what you produce from your ground, from your earth. But do not give away all that stuff that you yourself don't want. And if someone were to give it to you, you would not take it. Except if your eyes were closed and only grudgingly. So this is true charity. True charity is where you love for others, what you love for yourself, and even more than that. This type of ithar you'll find even to the point of death. The companions practiced it. In the Battle of Yarmouk, there's a great example, and it's something incredible. Hudayf al-Adawi, in the aftermath of the Battle of Yarmouk, this is after the Prophet ﷺ, he came to the battlefield looking for his cousin. And his cousin was Hisham ibn As. So, he, he had some water. He wanted to see if he needed something and he see how wounded he was. So he found his cousin and he was wounded, bleeding to death and he beckoned to him, can I bring you water? And he said yes and he beckoned yes. So he brought him the water and before he could drink, there was a sound from a person they presumed was dead close by and he was groaning um, and just like, so Hisham, he said, you know, no, give it, give it to him first. So this man went to the other person and when he went to him, he was about to give him water, and that person heard another third person, you know, making a sound. He was still alive. So this person, uh, Hudayfa, he went to the third person, but when he got to the third person, he had passed. And then he came back to Hisham, his cousin, and he had passed. Then he went to number two, the person number two, they had all passed. So this is the example of ithar that Allah loves, that this is to the point of death, you know, we all say, well, you have to take care of your, in our minds we have this idea, you have to take care of yourself first, and then you take care of others. But the real believers, the believers that have that rank of ithar, is really incredible. They, had, they lived in a different plane of existence. They preferred others over themselves, even though they themselves were needy. It's something, it doesn't make logical sense, but it's so true. In our own lifetime, we've seen so many people, in my own life, I've seen people who are the most generous are the people who are generally those who weren't well off. Um, where I grew up in, in Jersey City, I found that some of the homeless people, people who didn't have homes, they didn't have family, they were always living in the masjid. Every time there was a crisis, an earthquake somewhere in the world, some of these people, especially one where he would bring some money to me, they don't have computers, they don't have access to the internet, he would bring me $100, you know what, there's an earthquake, can you make sure this goes to Turkey? Can you make sure this gets to Kenya? And I know for a fact, that person is, you know, he's a person who's a recipient of zakah, not well off, has menial jobs, sometimes he doesn't have a home, sometimes he stays in the masjid. But just because you're poor and you're, you're, you have poverty doesn't preclude you from giving. So the, the giving that a person gives when they're in circumstances like that is much more valuable than someone who's well off and he gives a larger amount, but he's well off. So this is really incredible. There's so many stories, and I'll share just a couple to inspire us. In the Muwatta Imam Malik, there's a story from Aisha radiallahu anha. She was fasting. And when she was fasting, she only had one loaf of bread in the house to break her fast. So a beggar came to the door, and he asked for food. And she told her servant, okay, give him that loaf of bread. And that servant protested and said, you know what, you're fasting, you need to break your fast, you won't have anything. You know, so he, he kind of, she, or she, the, the servant was a female, she objected. And Aisha said, you know what, just give it. And don't worry about that. We trust in Allah. They gave the loaf away and that servant said, later that day, a neighbor sent them a head of sheep, one of the finest portions of meat. 
um, just as a gift. Unexpected, it came out of the blue. Imam Al-Qurtubi relates, when he relates this in his tafsir, he says, وَمَنْ تَرَكَ شَيْءً لِلَّهِ لَمْ يَجِدْ فَقْدَهُ Whoever does or leaves something for Allah, you will never find a want. You will never find that he lost it. Allah always replaces it, always comes back to you. Um, the final story I'll share, uh, Waqidi was a great historian from the time of Imam Malik. And this is from the time of the Tabirin or the Atbaw Tabirin. He was the person who wrote the Sira books. and the, So Waqidi, you know, it was time for Eid. His wife, she came to him and she said, you know what, we need to buy something for the kids, new clothes and toys, and we have nothing in the house. And Waqidi said, well, I don't have anything. So he thought about what to do. So he said, you know what, I have a friend who's Hashimi from Bani Hashim. He's from the family of the Prophet. And he's probably well better off than us. So he went to his Hashimi friend and he said the situation, you know what, you know, it's Eid is coming up, it's Ramadan and we have nothing to buy anything for our kids. Can you lend us some money and I'll pay you back later? Um, and that person gave him a sack, a, a sack of dirhams. And he just gave him the whole thing. He said, yeah, you know what, this is for you. So he came back home very pleased and he told his wife, my friend loaned me this. Now you can take care of your needs. Buy your kids, buy our kids, something for Eid. So while he was doing that, a, one of his friends came to, at the door and he shared the story. He said, you know what, it's Eid time, I have nothing, can I borrow some money? So he says, other friend came to him asking the same thing. So he came to his wife, right, he was like, kind of like us today. He came to his wife and he said, you know what, this is the situation, this is what I propose, let me give half of the, the money that I got to him. That way he can benefit and we can benefit. What did his wife say to him? She said, how stingy you are. You went to your friend, he gave you the whole sack of, of dinars. And now your other friend comes, you want to give him half of it? She said, give him all of it. Don't worry about it. So he gave him that sack of, of dinars. And this person, his friend, he, he looked at this sack and he said, where did you get this from? He said, I got it from my Hashemi friend. And he told him the story, you know what, this belonged to me. This is the only money I had. My Hashimi friend came to me and he said, I need something. I gave it to him. And then you came to him, he gave it to you. And now I'm coming to you. And it's, so they all laughed. And what they did is they did, divided up the, between the three of them. It was an incredible story of how Muslims lived, the ithar that they practiced. This story reached the Khalifa of the time, Ma'moon. And Ma'moon was the Khalifa, the Abbas. He was so impressed. He sent to each of them, all three of them, a thousand dinars of gold. He sent it to each one, the Hashmi friend, Al-Waqidi, and also this third person. But then he sent 2,000 to the wife of Waqidi. He said, she gets 2,000 because she was more generous than all of you. So this is what happens when you give, fi sabilillah. You never lose. You never lose. Always comes back to you. It's something incredible. And I'll end with a statement from Abu Yazid al-Bistami. You know, and it's something also very inspiring. He said, ma ghalabani ahadun ma ghalabani shabun min ahli balkh. He said, he had a memorable experience with a person. He said, no one ever overpowered me like this young man from Balkh. Balkh is a region in Afghanistan. This young man from Balkh, the experience I had with him, I've never forgotten. No one really made me speechless like that person. And in another narration, that was Shaqiq al-Balkhi, a great Zahid, a great early Muslim. So they asked him what, what happened. He said, this man came to us, Qadima alayna hajatan qala li. He came to us, we were in need. He said, Ya Aba Yazid, ma haddu zuhdi andakum. He asked me, what is zuhd among you people? Because he came from far away, and Abu Yazid is somewhere else, a different land. He said, how do you guys in your region practice zuhd? Zuhd is this idea of being absent from the dunya. So he said, this is how we practice zuhd. In wajadna akalna wa in faqadna sabarna. He said, if we have something, we eat from it. And when we don't have, then we're just patient. We have sabar. It's a great quality they had. They said, he, so he said, if we find means to eat and to, to enjoy, we do it. When we don't, we're patient. We don't complain. So what did this youth of Balkh say to Abu Yazid al-Bastami, another great Muslim? He said, Hakada kilabu balkhin indana. He said, you know what, that's like the dogs of Balkh. The dogs in our region, they live like you do. When they have food, they eat. When they don't have food, they're patient. So you're no better than the dogs in our region. So Abu Yazid said, okay, then how do you practice zuhud? What is zuhud among you people in Balkh? He said, he said, in faqadna, 
shakarna wa in wajadna atharna. He said, when we don't have anything, when we find that we don't have, we're not patient, we're shakir, we're grateful to Allah for, for you know, so many reasons. So when we, we're in a state of not having, we are grateful, shakarna. But when we have, we prefer others over ourselves. Not that we enjoy it ourselves, we give it to others. So this is an incredible testimony of what ethar is. This is a great quality that we need to revive in our, in our ummah, in our societies, in ourselves. This idea, وَيُؤْثِرُونَ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ وَلَوْ كَانَ بِهِمْ خَصَاصًا Prefer, preferring others, even though you yourself are in need. May Allah give us that quality of ithar. May Allah give us the quality, these noble qualities that we find among the companions, the muhajireen, the ansar. Hada wa sallallahu wa sallama ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Wa akhiru da'wana an ilhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Inshallah, every night we'll take a different topic. And for the next seven nights until the 27th, inshallah. I'm um, sure if there are any questions, um, we can take some questions. Yes. Yeah, so the question is about neighbors, like how, you know, the rights of the neighbors are great. Like how many neighbors? Is it the next door house or the house next to it? This is a great discussion among the Muslims and the answer depends on your generosity. So some of the scholars, like Imam Malik, for instance, they said that it's 40 houses in every direction, front, back, right, left. So it's not just the immediate house, but it's, it goes further down. Other scholars had different ideas. So the sky is the limit here. Islam is so flexible that, you know, there is so much scope for you to increase your reward. So your neighborhood, uh, people who live in your town are your neighbors, people who live close to your neighbors. Obviously the closer ones have greater priority and among those, those who are your relatives have more priority than the others. But the neighbors are all in all the directions. Wallahu ta'ala amin. verse is if I'm not mistaken Surah Al-Fatr I might be mistaken وَيُؤْثِرُونَ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ وَلَوْ كَانَ بِهِمْ خَصَاصًا وَمَنْ يُوْقَ شُحَ نَفْسِي فَأُولَا كَمُنْ Surah Al-Hashr Surah Al-Hashr Jazakallah khair That's for you to work out, brother, the balance. So that's no easy answer. It depends on where you want to be in the next life. The sky is the limit. So, you know, there are different approaches. And obviously, even the Prophet ﷺ, he saw a man giving all of his wealth away. And he said, you know, I'll leave some for your family. It's better your family has something than they become beggars of other people. So you have that as well. You want to take care of your family. That is a good thing. It's a noble quality. But ithar is something different. It's he thought it not, it's not something you can enforce on anyone. You know, what we enforce on uh, others are, is, is zakat. Allah's messenger enforced zakat. And if you look at what zakat is, so different from ithar. Zakat is your excess wealth, the wealth in your possession, the wealth you don't need after you fill your needs. If you have needs, you minus your needs from that. So that's what you give, and it's only 140th, 2.5%. It's a small amount. But ithar, so people think zakat is all you need to give. But zakat is the bare minimum. That's just to be a Muslim, you have to give zakat. If you don't do that, you're not even in the door. That's one of the pillars. But beyond zakat, there's sky is a limit. There's so many, there's sadaqah, there's infaq, there's ithar, there's so many ways of giving. So like, you know, like Abu Bakr and Umar, they're both great individuals. They're both motivated by iman. Abu Bakr, what happened between them and the giving? Remember, Umar said, you know what, I'm going to outdo Abu Bakr. I gave everything I have and I left only half for my family. So he came to the Prophet and he said that and then he came to Abu Bakr and Abu Bakr was like, I gave everything. I didn't leave anything for my family. So then he realized, you know what, Abu Bakr is higher than me. But Omar is a high station too. So the sky is the limit. You have to find the balance that works for you and all depends on where you want to be, how high you aim to achieve and where you want to be in the next life.
Wallahu ta'ala. So the question is, everything that the Prophet did, part of his mission, after he became a Prophet وسلم, And the answer is no. So you have to know, understand that the Prophet وسلم, was a human being, and he was a husband and a father. So there are some things he did in his capacity as a human being that we don't have to do. But then he was also a master of Allah. There are some things that he brought the message to us, he told us to do, and it was part of his guidance. So the job of a Muslim is to look at the Prophet's life وسلم, and look at his sunnah, which sunnah is sunnatul huda, which he meant for us to follow, and sunnatul ada, which he just did because he lived in Mecca or Medina. And so for instance, the particular type of dress he wore is not a guidance. There is no reward in wearing the dress of the Prophet because he didn't ask us to do that. But wearing you know, the type of clothes that he wore. The type of clothes that he wore, people forget, even Abu Lahab wore those clothes. Abu Jahl wore those clothes, the same jilbab, same turban. People think the turban is sunnah, even the turban Abu Lahab and Abu Jahl wore. So that's not part of the sunnah that we're expected to follow. The part of the sunnah we're expected to follow is that which is pertaining to hidayah, guidance, irshad, relating to the Quran. So we have to distinguish and sometimes people fail to distinguish and they make like industries out of their like you know, prophetic medicine, for instance, you know, Tibb and Nabawi. And the Prophet didn't give us a medical system to follow. That was just, he was sick, he participated in medicine, what was available in his time. But that wasn't meant for us to follow. So it's not necessarily sunnah to do hijama, like that flyer says downstairs uh, in the lobby, the prophetic sunnah of hijama. That's just something that was a custom of his time, that was the treatment available. Um, if someone does it out of love for the Prophet, it might be rewardable, might. But it's not guidance. We're not supposed to follow the Prophet in that. These are the adat of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We have to follow the hidayah of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allahu Should we close? 11.35, inshallah. Great energy on day one. Let's see day two and three and four, inshallah. Day 10? Okay. <laughs> yes. And we don't know which one is the odd or the even night like Sheikh uh, Abdullah this morning put us in confusion. <laughs> so now we don't know. The odd nights are really the even nights. And the even nights are the odd nights. <laughs> yeah. Okay, one last question. You got to speak up. Okay. No. So I, I don't know anything about Imam Mahdi. That's something I don't know anything about. Zero. Or Imam Mahdi. I'll tell you someone who might be able to help. I'll tell you, not in the microphone. <laughs> <show. laughs> okay.